Well, the title of this message is Jars of Clay. And I tell you, I feel like a clay pot this morning that's been run through the ringer. <laughs> so y'all just bear with me. Um, it's been kind of fun. I haven't really done this much in the past, but like last time I went back and listened to a message from four years ago and kind of gleaned from that and revamped it, of course, and applied it to today. So basically it's just the... Um, information I studied then but this message was everyday challenges it was four years ago and Brian and I had just spent a week in the San Juan Mountains in Colorado and had a few fun challenges while we were there and um, so it, listening to it really um, lifted me up lifted my spirits so it was good and it was fun but the challenges that I am experiencing right now aren't so glamorous. <laughs> those, were, those were some glamorous challenges. I wish that I would have been stuck on a side-by-side -side in the middle of nowhere in Colorado this week, but I wasn't. <laughs> I had one of those weeks that's like jug, uh, just drowning in work, paperwork at work. You know, it's back to school time, time to get all the teachers' contracts renewed and the first payroll done. And as the 4-H sponsor, I had the county fair last week, and you would think they could have made it at a better time <laughs> of the year, but just drowning in all of this work, extra time put in, and it's like life said, oh, I see that you're busy juggling all these things. Here, let me just punch you in the face. So, definitely a clay pot this morning. But back at the time that, um, that I had studied on challenges, I found that, you know, a definition of a challenge, part of the definition is a call to battle or a call to a contest, contest or a special effort. So, if I challenge you, I'm calling you to a contest. And so I put that in our wording and defined for myself challenge as life's call to engage your outer limits. And by engaging, when you're challenged in life, you are locating your outer limits and you're pushing against them and a lot of times expanding them. Not every time, but a lot of times. And you know, think about it in your life when you face a challenge, that's really what you're doing. You're locating the end of yourself, usually, and you begin to push against that. And either you stop or it expands to where you need to go. And so we all have every day, all the time, life's challenges, don't we? Yeah. You know, when I think about challenges in the Bible, one of the, the big guys that I think about is Paul. He had so many challenges, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. But... He had a unique outlook on those challenges. How many things did he go through? We go through nothing like Paul went through. But it was his perspective, his outlook, and the way that he thought about those things that enabled him to get through. I'm sure he located his outer limits every single time. How many times did he maybe thought, this is it? <laughs> I'm either gone or God's going to do something. <laughs> and he saw it every time. God did something. Yeah, so one place that he talks about this, he talks about it a lot of times. But in Romans 5, he says, verse 3, he says, Not only that, but we, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
So sufferings, the word that's also used a lot of times is tribulation. This is pressure. You ever felt life's pressure? Yeah, yeah. So this pressure, it's pressure like, you know, stomping out the grapes. You have to stomp out the grapes to get the good stuff out of them. So life puts pressure on us. And that produces something. It produces perseverance. Let's see. My Bible said endurance. And this is cheerful or hopeful endurance or constancy. You know, talking about growing up as a Christian, maturing and growing out of things, one of the biggest things that the world can see in us that will do them some good is constancy. For them to see a person, because we don't see this very often, do we? To see a person who was there before it got rough, who was the same when they were going through the storm, and they're still there after the storm, unfazed, often with their outer limits expanded. That's what the world needs to see in us. So it's this pressure that's producing that in us. And then that produces character. Character is the proven, tested, through experience part of us that stays. And that constancy is character. And all of this working together produces hope in us. Hope is to anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation, or confidence. Think about Paul in this, all the things that he went through. And here, all of this pressure, he has pressure, perseverance, constancy, and hope through it as a result. In 2 Corinthians, he kind of lists some things. In chapter 11, starting in verse 24, he, he wrote, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, Danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night. In hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And this is the man who also wrote, I know how to be abased and how to abound. I know how to be content in all things. Thank God that Paul was able to do this and then write about it. And now we're here able to learn from it. And if he can do it, we can do it. It's the same God on the inside of me and on the inside of you that was on the inside of him. He had it a lot harder than we do, for sure. (laughs) And earlier in in that same letter, he's writing... Well, no, let's see. I didn't want to I didn't want to skip this. So just a few verses down then in I was in 11 he said in 12. So in verse in chapter 12 he's saying, you know, I had a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet me and God said to me and I asked the Lord to take it away, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul writes, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
And Paul had witnessed time and time again God coming through in those weaknesses. That's why he could say this. He probably couldn't say this on the road to Damascus. He didn't know this yet. He knew it after he had made some people mad. They threw stones at him, thought he was dead, drug him out of the city, and left him there. And then what does it say? The disciples gathered around him, and he got up, and he went to Derby. <laughs> he knew this after that. And he knew what God could accomplish in his weakness. I, um, I enjoy reading Paul's letters to the churches and, you know, then going back into Acts and seeing, okay, what happened? You know, I, we're fixing to look at what happened to him in Philippi. Now go home and read the letter to the Philippians and see what he had to say to these people years, I guess, after that. So in Philippi, in Acts, he goes there, and he was really kind of trying to find out where he was supposed to go at this time. Uh, Silas, I think. Let me get there. Didn't mark that one with that. I marked it with this. Okay. Um, Silas is with him. And, yeah, Timothy. Okay, Timothy had just joined Paul and Silas. And they were really trying to figure out where they were going to go. It says they wanted to go here, but the Spirit wouldn't let them. And then Paul has a vision in the night. And it's a man from Macedonia saying, come help us. And so he knows that's where we're supposed to go. So they go to the region of Macedonia. And Philippi is one of the major cities in that, in that area they go to. And they start teaching like they do in every other city. And they convert Lydia and her household and, and a few people. And um, so they know this is where we're supposed to be, right? He saw a vision go there. So he knows he's on the right track. He knows he's right where he's supposed to be at this time. Easy peasy. <laughs> but one day, so they're going to the place of prayer, it says, and there's this slave girl that her owners were making money over her fortune telling. She had a spirit of divination, it says. And she annoyed the heck out of these guys. It says Paul was so annoyed because she was following him around, speaking out, saying, um, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. I don't know why that's a problem, but I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was causing a problem for them, I guess. Okay, and it says, And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Great! The girls delivered. Wonderful. They can go on about their business. No, he just messed up somebody's business. Yeah, money. So her owners got mad at him. <laughs> they were so mad that they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And they accused them and said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They're telling us we need to do things that we're not supposed to do. And so, of course, people were incited, and the rulers believed them, and they took them in, and they stripped their clothes off, and they beat them. And then they sent them to prison. Not only did they send them to the prison, they sent them to the inner prison, and they put their feet in the stocks, it says. How many of us, being in Paul's position right now, would think, Maybe this isn't where I was supposed to be. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything to that girl. <laughs> no, he did exactly what he was supposed to do, I suppose. 
<laughs> so they find themselves in prison, Paul and Silas. And it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you don't know what else to do but pray, sing, pray in tongues? I'm remembering when Isaiah was born, you know, I was scared 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 didn't know what else to do all I could do was lay on that bed and pray in tongues because I didn't I didn't know how to pray for it I didn't know what was going on what was going to happen that was the only way I knew to get it out whatever needed to be said it could be said then so that was just me grasping and hanging on as hard as I could to my father you know so Paul and Silas, I guess they don't know what else to do but sing and pray to God. And the other prisoners are listening to them. Gosh, who would do this? <laughs> and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So I guess it's dark in there, too, because the prison guard, he's fixing to kill himself because he knows that's going to be his fate. He's thinking, oh, my gosh, all the doors are open. These guys are gone. Gone. They are gone. I'm done. This is the end. And Paul sees it, and he cries out and says, no, stop. Don't do it. We're still here. <laughs> and so the guard's like, oh, how can I be saved? Like, you guys have something. You guys have something, and my life is worthless. It was fixing to end. How do I get what you guys have? I imagine that he had been listening to them, too, to know to ask this. So the jailer called for all the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they talked to him and all who were in his house, and he took them and washed their wounds, the same guy that was just guarding them in the prison. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. So what came of the pressure that Paul and Silas were feeling? So they were, you know, they did what they knew to do, as had happened time and time again. People got mad at them. And it was not fair. This was not fair. They had no fair trial. There was no trial. They didn't get to speak their case. No one was listening to them. They did what was right. They went where they knew to go, where they had been shown to go, and they get beaten and thrown in prison for it. But look what happened. And there's a church started here in Philippi. And I believe that this jailer and his family and probably all the prisoners in the jail were a big part of that church. Now go back and read Philippians and see what he had to say to them years later. That's, that's, that's fun, the fun part of the Bible. That's fun when you can go from here to there and, and see this is why Paul could write. You know, this is why you could say tribulations produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And he was surviving on that hope as he was singing and praying down in that prison. Yes. <laughs> and it's at these times that he saw, he witnessed the true power of the gospel. 
This is the true power of the gospel. He can go and preach and even heal people, and it's nice and sunshiny and everybody's smiling and people get saved, and that's great. But it's at these darkest midnight hours when he's almost dead that the true power of the gospel is revealed. And that man and the other men in that prison would not have been reached if he hadn't have been there. So let's have Paul's perspective on these trials. How about it? <laughs> Philippi had, would not have been the same had he not been there. Okay, I feel like we did Romans and we did 2 Corinthians, right? We haven't done 2 Corinthians 4. Here's something else he has to say about it. <clears throat> he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. When he sees that true power of the gospel, it is not him. What could he have done? Beaten, thrown in prison, in the stocks, what power is it of Paul's that these people get saved? Nothing. There is nothing that he did. All he was was in the middle of his situation, doing what he knew to get through it. And God takes over. Paul can't make an earthquake happen. He can't open prison doors, but he knows the one who can. And it's his power. We're just jars of clay with a great, great treasure on the inside of us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We can read the New Testament and Acts especially and see the life of Jesus displayed in these people. How about the New Testament church now today in 2019? We can see the life of Jesus manifested when we look around and see our brothers and sisters, each other, ourselves going through something, and we see that pressure is producing endurance, which is producing character, which is producing hope. Thank you, Lord, for hope. Thank you, Lord, for hope. Well, somebody else that saw a lot of this pressure, no doubt, was Jesus. What did he say to us that we can apply today when we're feeling pressured? In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This labor here means to feel fatigue or to work hard. And heavy laden is to load up, to overburden. I know that we all, at one point in our lives, have felt fatigued. <laughs> We've felt overburdened. I know just here in the last few weeks, I sometimes I say this to Brian, and I've said it again, haven't I? Like, let's just stop this train. I want to get off. <laughs> when is it going to come to a stop? Because <laughs> I want to get off. <laughs> Sometimes we can make ourselves rest, actual, literally, physically. Sometimes life just socks it, us in the face, and we have to rest. <laughs> come to me. All who labor, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
So we see this picture here of, you know, what comes to mind when you're talking about yoke, take my yoke upon you, is two oxen working together w with a yoke on them, that piece of wood that goes across their so shoulders and enables both of them together to carry a load or a burden or plow a field, do the work that's necessary. One thing I love about that picture is that so the yoke is the thing that connects them together. So we could say that's our relationship with Jesus. Our communion with Jesus is found in this yoke. And the load is not connected to an individual oxen. The load is connected to the yoke. That's the thing that pulls the load. So it's in our communion with him. He says, come to me if you're overworked, heavy laden, burdened, fatigued. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. That means it's productive. Easy mean, meant employed and useful. The actual load that Jesus has for us is useful. It's productive. So a lot of times we see the big picture of things and we think, oh, I've got to get all this done. I have to accomplish all of this, all of this. And sometimes, yes, it actually has to be done. But this little part over here, Jesus's load, this one thing that he wants us to accomplish is easy and it's light and so he says come to me and learn from me thank you god that you live on the inside of us he lives right here and so he's not only walking beside us he's walking in inside us and so we can easily join up with him do the task that he set before us but that load is connected to our relationship with him and that's how it's going to be pulled that's how it's going to be easy so whenever we feel that way we just stop ourselves and say god i rest in you you know how to do this you know give me the strength and the capacity to do what it is you're asking me to do today but i want to accomplish your task Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I just, I praise you that even in the things that seem difficult to us, there is a purpose. There's a thing to be accomplished. That that is producing character, it's producing constancy, and it's producing hope in our lives. And God, we just continue to participate with you and to mature. And so we, as this oxen standing here, Jesus, we say, yes, we'll stay and we'll do the task that you have for us today. We will be constant. And I thank you that no matter what it looks like, we can see that Paul was dragged out of the city and left for dead. He was put in the stocks in the prison, not knowing what the next day would bring. But we know that you are more powerful than our situations. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you care about the things that we care about. And so as we roll those cares over onto you, you gladly take them and you do something with them. Thank you, Father. I praise you. I praise you for the testimonies that will come out of today, for the hope that will come out of today. Amen.